Hi, I'm Ethan, I love muzzleloading, and this is the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton. Before the event this year, I was able to talk to one of the event organizers, John DeWald, about the event, and uh, it was really neat to get his perspective on the event. This has been in the works now for a couple years, and it started as a continuation and an evolution of the Gunmakers Fair at Dixon's, which was run for nearly 40 years by the Dixon family of the Dixon Muzzleloading Shop here in Kempton, Pennsylvania. It was decided by the family to stop running this weekend event. It's just a lot of work to put this on for the family. And thankfully, a group of organizations in the Pennsylvania and the national region here took it upon themselves to start up the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton and continue that tradition and carry it on for another generation. The Honorable Company of Horners, Jacobsburg Historical Society, National Muzzleloading Rifle Association, and the Pennsylvania Federation of Black Powder Shooters put together an extensive team of volunteers to organize this show and execute it to a wonderful degree, really. I don't think you see a lot of shows start their first year with the success that the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton has had. Over the first weekend here, they saw as many as 2,500 people in attendance to come and shop and learn, which is really fantastic, and I think really sets up the event for a, another great year and hopefully a great future here in Kempton. Now, if you've attended other muzzleloading or long rifle shows in the past or seen some of my other videos, a lot of this is gonna look a little bit similar. You're gonna see a lot of the same people that we see at a lot of the other East Coast or Eastern United States events here. You have a lot of artists and craftspeople and small businesses in the muzzleloading space renting tables in the indoor and outdoor venues here to, to sell their wares and supply the muzzleloading community with the materials and things that they need moving forward for the year. You have people like Chambers who supply locks and barrels and muzzle litter kits. Uh, to the building community, you have folks like the Log Cabin Shop supplying books and other materials. Uh, you have Ted Cash uh, supplying a lot of the, the boxes and inlays and, and other various kind of metal hardware that you see used in the muzzleloading community. You also have a lot of horns and, and bags. and You have everything that you could need here. This is the kind of event that you can come and outfit yourself and really get started in muzzleloader. You can walk away with your bag, your knife, your horn, and your muzzleloader really even, if you were looking for that at this kind of show. You can also pick up a variety of your period clothing and other accoutrements that you're gonna need to get out there and enjoy some living history or just the muzzleloading community in general. Apart from the shopping, there are two other major aspects of the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton that I think really set it apart and make it a destination event for anybody into muzzleloading. Those two aspects are going to be the educational aspect as well as the artistic study aspect of muzzleloading. So first off here with education, all through the weekend, just about all day, every single day, there were educational seminars going on in this outdoor pavilion. There was a beautiful breeze. and. With this, you kind of take a break from the hustle and bustle of the show and go down and learn from contemporary masters like Roland Cadle, Mark Thomas, Mitch Yates, and a plethora of other speakers. I mean, these, these talks went for about an hour, hour and a half, and they started in the morning and they went till the end of the day. And it was just a really great means to learn from these contemporary masters that you see a lot of, you see magazine articles, you see books about them, but this is an opportunity for folks to come and sit down and learn from them and ask questions. I mean, you can kind of follow a lot of these people online and follow their studies and their research and their execution of their historical studies, but it's another thing to be able to come and sit down and talk with them at their seminar. Now, there were quite a few people at these seminars, but it was still a really personal experience to sit down and listen to these talks about various aspects of historic accoutrement making. And this is one of the aspects that is carried on from Dixon's and, and I think will evolve with time here as the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton continues.
As somebody who likes to make some of their own accoutrements, I really enjoyed the artistic study that was there at the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton. You could go in and, and talk with people that were doing the hard research and trying to figure out how things were made and, and going through the development process to rediscover how a lot of these things like horns and bags were made and really the oddities of it. I mean, we're at a point I think now with contemporary accoutrements where the kind of base level of, of bag and horn making has been figured out and that information is being shared. And now we're kind of going into a next level, I think, where artists and makers are finding weird odds and ends in history, finding those original examples that thankfully survive and figuring out how to make them and how to make some really interesting things based on those original oddities. And with that, at the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton, another continuation from the Dixon's muzzleloading fair here was the juried uh, critique and discussion of contemporary accoutrements. So if you're somebody who likes to make your own accoutrements like a bag or a horn or anything else related to muzzleloading, I mean, uh, there, were, there were horn cups, there were flasks, there were rifles, there were smoothbores, you know, any aspect of kind of traditional American art, you can enter it and have it judged and critiqued. And it's not necessarily a competition. And I think that was one of the greatest things I heard from the folks entering their contemporary pieces here is they weren't out to necessarily come home with a big ribbon and beat out their friends because there's a lot of friendship in these communities. The opportunity here is getting some honest artistic critique and having a discussion with contemporary masters that do a lot of study, a lot of research into this stuff and publish books about it. Hearing what they have to say about your work. These masters are literally going through your piece that you have entered and pointing out things that you can improve on or things that they like, things that you can continue working with, which is really invaluable in this day and age. It's really easy now to get feedback when you publish something online, but to be able to sit down and talk with a contemporary master and go through your piece section by section and learn from that is really incredible. And I think that is one of the best things about the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton here because they're really putting in the work to have an opportunity for people young and old, experienced and inexperienced, to learn and grow. It didn't matter if this was your first horn or if you're a master horner, you can enter what you're working on and have it judged and critiqued so that you can learn from that and you can come back next year with something even better and you can advance your own artistic expression of contemporary American culture here, which I think is so important. The hustle and bustle of our lives makes it hard to sit down and focus on anything right now and to have an event that furthers that culture and promotes that culture of sitting down, slowing down, researching, studying, and making something with your hands. It's the kind of thing I really want to see us get back to just as a people. I'm not trying to get too grandiose about it here, but it's I love it. I love being able to go to an event like this and seeing people excited about slowing down and working with their hands. It's the kind of thing that I think we're gonna to continue to see, and I'm happy to see the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton promoting that culture. And along with that, I wanna say here that I was able to meet with a variety of young makers here. The next generation, I think, and these are the kids that you're gonna see growing up in the muzzleloading community here, and they're gonna be the ones carrying on this tradition. I've always kind of thought of myself as one of the younger people in this community, but it was so nice to see at the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton, the promotion and the proliferation of young people getting into this so they can continue to make pieces like this. In previous years, I was told that they had two or three entries of, of young people, kind of younger than 18, entering their accoutrements to be judged, and this year they had more than 10 which is a wonderful thing to hear, and I think a great sign for the future of muzzleloading and traditional craftspeople that we're seeing here at this show. Thankfully, I was able to sit down with a few of them and discuss a little bit about what they like about making their accoutrements and why they're sticking with it. I am Rowan Byers. Callie Borneman. Connor Byers. Kennedy Borneman. So you guys are probably the youngest people here. Is, you think that's fair to say? No. 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 So how did you get started and, and what do you enjoy about making some of these traditional accoutrements that you're entering in for the judging? Uh, la uh, last Gunmakers Fair, I entered my cali my 45 caliber rifle. Um, I started building it when I was 8 and finished it when I was 10. Um, I made a southern banded horn with my rifle. 
this year I made a Scottish flat horn and entering it this year. How long did it make you to finish the Scottish flat horn? Uh, probably about a month or two. Okay. Not too long, but scrimshaw is kind of hard. Yeah. Are you nervous about entering it in the judging? Um, a little bit because I've seen what's up there so far. Yeah. I made a southern banded horn. I have about four weeks of work put into it. And just, it was, it was a kind of a cool experience to have because I'd never made anything like that myself. Had you made other items beforehand or did you jump right into the horn? Well, I had made, I, I had weaved straps before, but other than that, no, not okay. really. So what made you want to jump into making a, a banded horn then? Uh, I was kind of forced into it. Okay. A little parent leverage there? Yep. Okay. But you enjoyed it, right? Yes, I did. Okay. And you got competition. Yeah. I didn't make anything, and the reason was is because I usually make the food for big events, usually snacks, and the 25th anniversary in Altoona, I made four things for everybody to eat, and everybody loved it, so clearly I'm doing a good job. Did you make anything that's at the table that you're banning, or is that your folks' table? Um, I made buttons and hawthorn thorns. Okay, so that counts. Do you enjoy Do you enjoy making that stuff? Yeah, it's pretty easy to make. Yeah. I didn't enter anything this year, but hopefully next year, me and my dad are planning on. Well, I'm planning on making a knife to enter into the uh, judging and everything. I don't know how, I, I'm into the blacksmithing aspect, not a whole lot the horn building, but I think that'll be an interesting experience. Yeah, you can kind of grow into it as you're yeah. figuring this stuff yeah. out, kind of start in one spot. Yeah. I started with a horn that I'm entering this year. I made a York horn, and then I'm currently building a gun. Oh, wow. Did you enjoy making the York horn to start out? I did. Was that your first horn or your f kind of first project in this? Yeah, it was my first project making anything in the horn guild. Okay. What kind of rifle are you building now? Jacob Dickerts. Okay. Are you enjoying that process? I am. And are you planning on going out hunting with that or are you just going to be? Yeah. Okay, that's great. Hunting whitetail? We're actually planning a um, hunting, like a trekking. Okay. Trip. Soon. When she's done hers, I started rendezvous when I was young, when I was born. So I was already in all that stuff. Um, but it's kind of part of me now. So yeah. You guys feel like you have kind of a, a second family when you're coming to an event like this. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Too many uncles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you enjoy? I mean, taking part of, like, your summer vacation here to come out to something like yeah. this? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's much better than you, school. You learn a lot here. Yeah. A lot about American history, and yeah. it's just a lot more than what teachers can teach. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, you guys enjoy getting hands-on with it. I mean, yeah. going through these processes, you're doing a little more than learning about the history. Yeah. I mean, you're living it yeah. you know, by making this stuff. Do your friends look at you funny when you, you tell them about this stuff? Yeah. No. Yeah. Not a little bit. Not a lot. <laughs> so what's something, I mean, it's kind of cliche, but like everybody's worried about all the old people around here. And, <laughs> and you guys, I mean, everybody's going to tell you, but you're kind of the next generation of yeah. this. Yeah. Like, are you, are you excited to be a part of this yeah. and continuing this yeah. tradition yeah. in history? Yeah. Because it's not going to be around forever. Cause, I we mean, want it to be, though. Yeah. <laughs> but we're going to do our best to keep it around forever. Yeah. And that's all we can do. So just try. Hello, my name is Avery Davis. I am Brett Davis's daughter. I'm 11 years old and I'm from Green Lane, Pennsylvania. And what did you make for the Gunmakers Fair at Kenton this year? I made a 50 caliber rifle and I entered it entered it in, in today. Were you nervous about entering your 50 caliber yes, rifle? Yes, I was. Yeah? How do you get over some of that nervousness? Um, I'm actually not quite sure. It's just, it goes away naturally. Okay. Did you enjoy working on your rifle? Yes, I did with my father. It was very fun. What was the process like? Did you go to your dad and say you wanted to build a rifle, or did he just bring you into the shop? Oh, it was one day after Taekwondo on a Tuesday morning. Okay. Dad, actually it was actually an evening on Friday. Dad said, 
we're gonna, I'm going to buy a rifle from Barbie Chambers so we can build it. And I was like, I was so excited because of my early birthday present. And then on Tuesday morning, a couple weeks later, my rifle, the kit came in. And I was so excited. I was jumping for joy. And then when Dad came home Tuesday, Tuesday night, we started building on it, building it. And I was super excited on it. And I, I'm just so excited to finish it. Yeah. Was it hard? Yes, it was very hard. It took a lot of muscle. Yeah? Mm-hmm. You feel stronger after doing it? Yes, I do. <laughs> I'm now able to pick up 50 pound bag of rabbit feed every day. There you go. So which chambers <laughs> did you build? Um, do you remember? No, it's Barbie chambers. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. They, they have some great kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> have you shot it yet? Yes, I have a Dixon's muzzleloading shot. Yeah? Did uh -huh. you enjoy it? Yes, I shot 100 yards offhand. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. Are you going to go hunting with this rifle? Then? Probably, yeah. Okay. Very cool. What was your favorite part uh, of putting the rifle together? I think my most favorite part was um, filing out and cutting out the toe plate because we did we put a heart uh -huh. on the toe plate and it was very fun to do that. Okay. Do you think you're going to continue making guns and, and yes. equipment? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Are you going to have something next year here for the gun makers? Fair? Probably like a horn or something that I poly scrim uh, poly scrimshaw. Okay. Mm -hmm. To go with your gun. Uh huh. Awesome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, no, that's all. Okay. <laughs> When I go to an event like this, I have a lot of discussions with people about the next generation and about kids. And it's really easy to think about the kids that we see on TV and the kids that we see as we just go to stores. You know, I was at the grocery store last week and saw a bunch of kids walking around with tablets in their hands as their parents shopped. And it's really easy to get discouraged when we see things like that. But I really hope that meeting and hearing from some of these kids at the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton encourages you to not only encourage the kids in your lives to get involved and get started with this. And I also hope it encourages you to take a different look at some of the kids out there and, uh, and maybe see them as, as the future in this. You know, it's, uh, it's not just about the tablets and the video games. You know, there are a lot of kids out there that are interested in this stuff and are really passionate about continuing it. I mean, talking <laughs> with the kids there, I didn't really prompt them to say a whole lot. You know, I was just kind of interested in what they had to say about contemporary accoutrements and things. And, and hearing that they were passionate about seeing this tradition continue at such a young age, I think really makes for a bright future in the muzzleloading community. Along with the passion of these kids and their contemporary accoutrements, I want to say that I've heard for years about the enthusiasm of Pennsylvania and its enthusiasm for muzzleloading, but I had no idea how enthusiastic 
Pennsylvanians were until I was there talking with them. I mean, wow. There were times where I felt like I couldn't get through an aisle way without talking to a bunch of Pennsylvania muzzleloading enthusiasts. I mean, you guys, you guys have it right out there. I mean, that traditional Pennsylvania flintlock season that comes at the end of the year, that is just pure gold. And what it's doing for muzzleloading in Pennsylvania is just incredible. I mean, the number of people I talked to at the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton, I know it was kind of self-selecting because it's a muzzleloading show, but I talked to so many people there who started hunting as a young person or as a kid with their family with center fire, uh, you know, modern rifles and things. And now, you know, they're in their early 20s, their early 30s, and even up to, you know, your 60s, 70s, 80s. They're only going out there with their flintlock or their traditional muzzleloader. And that passion is everywhere out there. The passion that Pennsylvanians have for their history and American history is just incredible. Driving through the hills there, you see these little villages and towns. You see beautiful old barns that have been, you know, kept nice. I mean, they've been taken care of. And, and where I'm from, it's so heartbreaking to see so many old buildings that fed and, and made this country possible falling down. But Pennsylvania has a great pride in their history. And that's just an incredible thing to see. And that pride extends, you know, into muzzleloading and into the associations that are out there keeping this alive. I was able to talk to the president of the Pennsylvania Black Powder Federation about Pennsylvania's enthusiasm for muzzleloading here a little bit. Here's Jeff Warner. My name is Jeff Warner. Uh, I'm the president of the Pennsylvania Federation of Black Powder Shooters. We are mainly a competitive shooting organization. The existence of the uh, federation is really to uh, hold the state championship every year in Pennsylvania. We travel from club to club. We like to anyway. We try to travel across the state. To organize the state shoot, we uh, we sell memberships. And what you get with a membership is a it's a shoot book that lists shoot dates for all of our charter clubs. We have 30 charter clubs the whole way across the state, even some in New York and New Jersey. So it, it lists all their shoot dates throughout the year. Tons of shooting to do throughout the year. Uh, uh, throughout the state. Membership's real cheap. It's 15 bucks for individual, $20 for family, which includes you, your wife, and uh, any uh, children that you have under the age 18. State shoot is a uh it's at the end of August, coming up here the last weekend of August. It's a good time. Uh, we have uh, t targets and aggregates for everybody. Uh, we try to be inclusive, and you can also try out for the state flintlock team at the state shoot. And that's where so. you go and compete against Kentucky. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Kentucky comes up to us in the spring, and now uh, we go down to them in the fall. Last year, we beat the Kentuckians pretty good. Um, this year, we're hoping to do the same. They got some real good shooters down there. Uh, uh, but we like to whoop them. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but it's, it's all friendly. All in all, the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton is, is really a special event, I think. And I think it's going to continue to promote and support muzzleloading culture in Pennsylvania and the surrounding area. I couldn't tell you how many people I met that were from Pennsylvania, but also from the rest of the East Coast. And that's why I'm so happy to hear that the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton is continuing this great tradition. And it's kind of serving as a, as a point, I think, for muzzleloading enthusiasts in the Eastern United States to come and meet and talk and, and share their love of this. It's, it's one thing to do everything online and, and to talk to people online, and I know that's where I'm at most of the time, but you really cannot beat going to an event like this. And I really encourage you, that if you can make it, if you can budget for it, and if you can make it to an event like this, you're never going to forget it. I mean, the, the opportunities at the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton are, are just really incredible. The, the people that I was able to talk to and the things I was able to learn, it was just it was just wonderful. I felt like I went to a, a muzzleloading college course for the weekend, and it was just a, a great, a great thing. And it's a great thing to see continuing here. I think as as things are kind of tumultuous culturally here in the United States, it's nice to kind of slow down and go and meet people and, and talk with people that are kind of in this tribe, so to speak. There are a bunch of like-minded individuals here at an event like this. And you really feel less alone. So if you're out there and you're kind of out in the sticks like I am, not a lot of muzzleloading going along, where you're at, I encourage you to try to make the trip uh, to an event like the Gunmakers Fair in Kempton.
I always receive a lot of questions about what I picked up at an event uh, like the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton. And I always try to save a little bit of money each, each week for when I know I'm going to a show like this. Um, I took a little money here with me and I want to walk you through a little bit of what I got uh, to talk about the people that make this stuff and, and what I'm going to be using it for. And first up, I purchased a couple polished horns here. Uh, it was interesting talking with Roland Kate a little bit that it's really hard to get raw horns in the United States. So you get a lot of polished horns and this is the kind of thing that you can pick up um, at an event uh, like the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton. I picked these up from Powder Horns and more. You can find him on Instagram. He's pretty active there. Uh, and these are just a couple pretty white, pretty light colored polished horns that I'm going to be working with this winter. Uh, I like to draw. And so for me, uh, engrailing or, or carving on a horn is kind of like second nature. It's kind of where I can, I can go from my sketchbook and, uh, and apply it to a three dimensional shape here and have a lot of fun with it. It was neat talking to Gary at Powder Horns and more because uh, he talked a little bit about what business was like during COVID. And it's the kind of thing that we've heard a lot of. Unfortunately, we've seen some businesses and events not be able to make it through uh, all the event cancellations of COVID. But uh, Gary talked that he made nearly two or three times the number of horns during 2020 to 2022 here that he did in any year previously, which is really encouraging. It shows a lot of demand for people wanting to get into muzzleloading. And I think that's really exciting. Uh, we can talk about it again, you know, people talk about it all the time, dying out, everybody's getting old. There's a ton of people wanting to get into this. And I think talking to Gary there, there's a, another good sign of hope here for muzzleloading. It's not accoutrement or raw material focus, but I had to pick up this cool shirt from Cabin Creek Muzzleloading. Shane and Brad Emig had these at the show. Uh, just a really nice shirt. I love the, the green and the design there, Freedom and Flintlocks. You can't beat that. I'm uh, excited to get that and, and wear that around. I also picked up uh, Horn and Fiber with Clinton and Kerry. Had these little forged vent picks and uh, they were like, I think 250. I just had to pick them up. I love Clinton and and Carrie and seeing them at this show was so exciting. It was great to meet them in person. Uh, so I picked up a couple of these. I have a couple of muzzle loaders, like you saw my uh, flintlock pistol maybe. I needed a vent pick and I need one for my Southern Mountain Rifle. Uh, so picking up a couple of these from Clinton and Carrie was just something I had to do. Um, really nice little forged ends on there and something you're always gonna need, you know, if you're shooting a flintlock. Also picked up a couple patches, Shoots and Powder. I gotta give a shout out to Shoots and Black Powder because they sponsored the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton here. It's great to see a powder manufacturer like Schutzen giving back to the community and making sure that events like this can happen. Uh, they had hats and shirts and, and patches there. Uh, you kind of had to move quick if you wanted to get them. They kind of put them out a little bit through the weekend. It was kind of tough. So I'm glad I picked up a Schutzen black powder patch. I'm going to be putting this on my shooting jacket and kind of represent a nice brand that keeps some support in the community. Also picked up a Pennsylvania Federation of Black Powder Shooters patch, another one that I just gotta put on a bag or my shooting jacket. I'm not in Pennsylvania, but uh, the stuff that they're doing with the Federation out there is the kind of thing I'd love to see in each and every state. Uh, the advocacy that they have for muzzleloading, uh, they were one of the main proponents driving the Pennsylvania flintlock season back in the day, and they're looking to get more involved in, in making sure that the legislation writers and the game commissions out there in Pennsylvania know about the enthusiasm that Pennsylvanians have for muzzleloading. You can see on my shirt here, I had Gunmakers Fair at Kempton shirts. It's something I had to pick up. Uh, it's nice to represent. It's an easy way to support the show. One of the last things I picked up uh, kind of on my winter projects list here, this is a nice flat powder horn or powder flask made by Roy Antosh. He had this on his table with a bunch of other ones. And it's something I just wanted to get and pick up uh, because a lot of the work is already done. I I'd like to get into uh, heating up and, and boiling some of my own horn to, to flatten it and figure this stuff out. But um, for this, this was something that I can take home and into the shop. I can clean it up just a little bit more, work on the tip, and I can get right to engrailing or scrimshawing on here uh, and just kind of jump right into a project. So if you're maybe intimidated by working with a polished horn and going from the start, that's something that's really neat about these events is you'll have horners that are working with horn that make kind of project horns like this one, 
where you can pick it up for a really reasonable price. Uh, I think this was $45, uh, which is just wonderful because it's a, it's a small expense that I can come to the event, pick it up, and I can come home and experiment with some things. Uh, so I'd like, really like to thank Roy for that. It was nice to sit down and talk with him a little bit at his table. I mean, this is a really small section. If I could, I would love to support and buy something from each and every table. But I hope that seeing some of the video here of, of all the tables and the things that you can find at an event like this inspires you to get out and support some of the businesses in this community because they're going to these events, you know, it's, it's a business, it's part of their livelihood, but they're also going to educate and share. And just about every table that you wanna stop and talk to, there's gonna be somebody there willing to share it with you what they know and, and how they learned it and pass that on to you. We're, we're seeing that resurgence now in muzzleloading where people are wanting to share what they know with a younger generation and with new people getting into muzzleloading regardless of your age. And that's really exciting. I think that is going to secure the future of muzzleloading for a long, long time. And I keep saying it, but events like the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton really make that possible. They centralize it and organize it in an area like Eastern Pennsylvania here and make it possible for people to continue to engage and learn about muzzleloading and all of its associated crafts and trades. That's really all I have for you here on the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton. If you enjoyed this video and want to learn more about the show or see a different perspective, I really encourage you to check out David Belzer's video on the Squirrel Tail YouTube channel, as well as Mike Bellevue's video on the Duelist 1954 channel. Both of these guys were at the event through the weekend, and they're going to provide you with a different look at the show that I can provide. And I really encourage you to check out their channels. They're doing some wonderful stuff for muzzleloading. And I really encourage each and every one of you out there, if you like these events and you're interested in, in promoting and furthering muzzleloading culture, take a camera the next time you go to an event, shoot a little video, just about everybody that I have asked has been okay with me filming their wares and their tables. So please, you know, get out there, engage with some of the people at these events and help promote and share this wonderful community and this wonderful culture. It's the only way we're going to see it continue. And I think and we're on a good track to see it continue. So I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions about this or anything else related to muzzleloading, please visit ilovemuzzleloading.com. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.